Hi, I'm Simon Fredrickson, CEO and co-founder of Pixelgen Technologies. Today, we're going to present to you a new technique called molecular pixelation. It enables the study of proteins and their spatial localization in networks in three dimensions. This is the next frontier of biomedical research now enabled on single cells. Pixelgen was started in the year 2020. We are almost 30 employees with nine patent families, and we launched our first products on single cell spatial proteomics in last year, 2023. So Pixelgen's vision is based on the fact that life operates by the nanoscale spatial orchestration of protein constellations. And our mission is to develop reagents and tools to be able to study these at an unprecedented level beyond the limits of light. Immune cells operate by many different ways and are essential in health and disease. When immune cells get trained to find foreign peptides from infections or from cancers, antigen presenting cells train T cells in what's known as the immune synapse. The immune synapse forms between these two cell types for them to enable communication around the CD3 TCR complex. In this complex, there are many immuno-oncology drug targets. The action of CAR T cells on cancer cells also involve reorganization of the surface protein of the CAR T cells. And some CAR T companies are even engineering this spatial organization to make the CAR Ts more efficient. When T cells and other immune cells wander into an infected site or a tumor, they need to form a front and a back end in order to move and to transmigrate between endothelial cell layers. This is the most important part of clearing out a tumor in immuno-oncology. And the front and the back end formation, of course, involves multiple reorganizations of the immune cell surface proteins. When antibody-based drugs bind to cancer cells, there are instances where they reorganize the surface protein of that cancer cell. So when rituximab, for example, binds CD20 on cancer cells, it pulls all the CD20 to one end, clustering the antibodies, which triggers NK-mediated killing of ADCC of these cancer cell lines and makes that much more efficient. So if you look at the tools available to study these processes, which is sometimes referred to as deep phenotyping of immune cells, you can look at high content analyses, which measure multiple proteins on the surface of the cell, but does not localize them. You have SiteSeq, AbSeq, Cytoff, and flow cytometry for these uh, measures. But on the other axis, the spatial dimension, the spatial resolution requires a microscope to look where the proteins are in relation to each other. And with the microscope, you can only detect a handful of proteins at the same time. So with molecular pixelation, we are combining the ability to look at many things, also with their spatial localization, only driven by a DNA-based readout. So instead of localizing the proteins with a microscope and light and fluorescence, we are using a purely DNA-based signal which drives our resolution and multiplexing throughput and other capacity measures. Using DNA to solve protein detection problems has historically been very successful. Most notably, the proximity extension assay was developed to drive throughput sensitivity and capacity for proteins in blood plasma, which are not localized. Here, two DNA tags were bound to antibodies that upon pairwise recognition gave a DNA-based signal for reading many, many proteins simultaneously. In our method, molecular pixelation, we convert the proteins present also into a DNA tag, but this DNA tag also includes the spatial location of proteins. So with Pixelgen, we want to bring the power of DNA-based protein detection to the spatial realm. The molecular pixelation chemistry is only a kit with a few reagents that you mix with your sample in a solution phase. So no microscopes, no photography is needed to make this method work. Typically, you would start the method with your PBMC cells or other immune cell types, and you fix them with PFA to lock the spatial organization into place. Then you bind the cells with antibody oligonucleotide conjugates, or AOCs, 
that we have optimized and verified for specific binding to these target proteins. So that is in step one of the method. It's very similar to standard flow cytometry type staining, where the cells are present in a vessel in solution, and you bind the antibodies, then you wash them, and you add the next reagent. So after binding, in the second step, we perform something that we call pixelation A. And we add our DNA-based molecular pixels. So these are nanometer-sized repeat concatenators of a certain unique molecular identifier. So each DNA pixel has a unique DNA sequence, which fuses with the sequence on the antibody oligonucleotide that's bound to the cell, forming a co-localization zone, which we call co-localization zone A. And this step is then repeated in pixelation B, but with another set of DNA-based pixels, which effectively co-localizes the co-localization event, forming a complete mesh of 3D-based information of where the proteins are in relationship to each other on a single cell. So the entire method does not need any instrumentation or single cell compartmentalization, which is common in single cell research. The pixel structure organizes and figures out what is one cell and what is another cell in the computational data analysis part. So at the end of this reaction, you get a PCR product that you feed into your next generation sequencer, and this sequencer uh, reads about 120,000 reads per single cell, and that is fed into our software, which we call Pixelator, which figures out which cell is which, where the proteins are on the cell, and many other spatial metrics that we'll soon get to. So this method requires no optimization, and there's no equipment necessary. In the data analysis of this method, each mathematical graph represents one single cell. So in this uh, illustration, the graph data is to the left, the blue spots are proteins present on a certain cell, and to the right you can see how the graph network has formed by starting with the protein ID tag, the zone A tag and the zone B tag, and how that forms a spatial network that can be used and mined with spatial statistic metrics to figure out where the proteins are in relationship to each other without any microscopy. You can also find more information on molecular pixelation in our BioArchives preprint that's available there. This has also been accepted for publication in Nature Methods and should be out online within the first half of 2024. We have three different metrics that we're going to go through today. The abundance of the proteins, the spatial distribution of a single protein, and the co-localization of two proteins, and how we calculate those metrics for each single cell and for each protein. So regarding abundance measurements, these are of course similar to flow cytometry or um, CYTOF or other methods that measure the amount of a protein on a single cell. Molecular pixelation also generates that data, and using a PBMC blood draw sample, we can easily identify the various immune cell subtypes based on what surface markers and how much they have. And moving on to the more unique spatial metrics that the method provides, the spatial distribution of each protein on each single cell, we have derived what we've called a polarity score. And the polarity score describes the non-randomness of one protein's spatial distribution on one single cell. If the polarity score is negative, it's very evenly distributed in an organized fashion. If it's around zero, it's randomly dispersed. Or if it's clustered, the polarity score uh, has a positive value. And this spatial statistics is based on the Morans I score. So in this example, we took T cells and stimulated them via CD3, and that is well known to generate a polarized T cell. So in the microscopy image in B, you can see the T cells having more CD3 at one end of the cell after stimulation than in the non-stimulated cell. And going to study the polarity score, you can see that CD3 has a very high polarity score, the non-randomness of distribution on the stimulated cells, but not on the unstimulated cells, while other protein scores are virtually unchanged. The data can also be presented as spherical objects where 
they are tessellated into each pixel and highlighted which pixel contain the certain protein detected. So CD2, CD3, 45, or 11A, as in this image here. And the data is naturally three-dimensional and can be used to generate spinning spheres also. So here is an orb with the data projected and the CD3 as it's polarized has been highlighted in red on the pixels that do contain CD3. When studying drug mode of action, uh, one example is rituximab, which polarizes CD20 on Raji cancer cell lines. And that is one of its main modes of action to attract NK cells and help trigger their cancer cell killing activity by being a clustered antibody on the cancer cell. So if we add rituximab to Raji cancer cells, the CD20 polarity score goes up a lot in the stimulated cells, but not in the unstimulated cells, which we also verified with microscopy in the green microscopy image to the right. This can provide new insights into the mode of action of drugs, not only by what they bind, but what they reorganize on the surface in the surface proteome, which is essential for CAR T therapies or any antibody-based uh, drug. So coming to the final metric, which is the co-localization score. So for each reaction, you get 1,000 cells of spatial information and 80 proteins in each cell. So you get the abundance of AT proteins, the spatial distribution of AT proteins, but with the co-localization metric, you get 80 by 80 co-localization events. So we've developed our co-localization score to go from minus to plus. If it's minus, proteins are segregated from each other in space. If it's near zero, it's pretty much randomly distributed. And if it gets positive, these proteins are co-localized. And what we used in these metrics is to describe dynamic changes in the spatial reorganization of the surface proteome under various conditions. So when T cells migrate, they form a front and a back end, as we mentioned in the beginning. And the back end is known as the uropod. And in the uropod, there are a number of well-known proteins that exist. And in this experiment, what we did is we took T cells, immobilized them on an ICAM-1 coated surface to simulate an endothelial cell layer, and added Rantus, which is a chemokine and a number of other chemokines as well in other control experiments. And in the stimulated cells, CD50 in the microscopy image here goes to one end of the cell, which is expected, and that is our control. But what does it look like when we use molecular pixelation and generate an 80 by 80 matrix of spatial information? So the data can be presented in different ways. In this heat map here, you can clearly see that CD37, CD50, and CD162 co-localize into the Europod as the positive score reaching the orange-red levels. Another interesting thing to note here is that a lot of measures are blue, meaning negative. So they are not co-localizing, but actually segregating. So the score here is describing the difference between a resting T cell and the T cell that's been stimulated to migrate. And if the score goes blue, that is segregation. And you can see certain proteins are then, of course, being excluded from the Europod, generating a very wealthy and rich level of information on how these cells operate. The data can also be presented in this way, where the blue lines mean uh, segregation and the red lines are um, co-localization. The data here is presented from a series of single cells. Uh, six of them have been selected for visualization, where CD3 and CD45 are background markers, which are randomly dispersed on the cells, while CD162, 37, and 50 are known to be at the Europod. So you can look and isolate each single cell at a time to visualize them. And uh, this is cell 436 at the top row. And you can even with your eyes see that 162, 37, and 50 are co-localizing at the, at the top end of the cell. Another beautiful way to illustrate this data is to use the natural graph of the data. So to the left here is the T cell that was stimulated to migrate, forming the uropod and highlighting the uropod proteins in blue. And to the right is a T cell that has not been stimulated, which is then the control.
Even though making these images is very nice and looks great, the real magic of the method is in the data analysis and in the objective way to use these co-localization, polarization metrics to derive statistically valid conclusions on your experiment. Looking at the number of B cell cancer cell lines, we can study abundance differences between these cancer cell lines and healthy B cells from a PBMC sample. And we can see a lot of well-known differences in abundance here, which has been utilized often for drug development purposes and finding targets that are more often expressed on the cancer cells compared to the healthy cells. But adding the polarity of these proteins to the equation, one might be able to find new drug targets that are not only based on the abundance of the target, but also how polarized is it and how natural would it then be for it to be a more effective cancer target. So CD54 and CD82, for example, is very polarized in the natural state on Raji cancer cells versus healthy B cells. And a few other proteins have differences in polarization on the cancer cells versus B cells. And then moving on to the final metric, co-localization, we see an even greater difference between cancer cells and the healthy B cells, where there's many, many significantly different co-localization events between these cancer cells and the healthy B cells, which is a new level of information that has previously been unstudied. Another interesting way to apply molecular pixelation is to discover new mechanisms for known proteins. In this case, we did a study on CD4 T cells. We stimulated them and compared them to unstimulated T cells uh, to see if we could find unique differences in polarization. At the top left UMAP, we have the resting T cells highlighted in green and the stimulated ones in orange. And the UMAP is based on all the protein abundances. One of the CD markers is then highlighted for abundance in the top middle. And to the right, we have its polarization score. And you can clearly see to the right that the polarization is occurring only in the stimulated cells and not so much in the resting cells. In the bottom middle quadrant here, we show the difference between the stimulated and the resting cells for abundance of the CD marker, which does not change very much. But when it comes to polarization, it gets very polarized when it comes to the stimulated cells. And this is new information about this particular CD marker, which will be very interesting to figure out what does this do for the biology of these CD4 T cells. After you run your next generation sequencing reaction, the FASTQ file of the sequence is fed into a software that we've developed here at Pixelgen that we call Pixelator. It's a freeware open source software that you can download from our website that provides you with all the spatial metrics that we've talked about today, as well as a quality control measure. The first product that we have launched on molecular pixelation is an immunology panel one for human immune cells. It enables you to deeply phenotype human immune cells for 80 protein markers with all these spatial metrics that we have been talking about today. For eight samples, 1000 cells per sample in each kit. There's no specialized equipment needed. You work with your cells in suspension and the NGS library is prepared in two days. And as I mentioned, the Pixelator software is freely available to download from our website to enable you to analyze the results. Thank you for listening to our presentation today. Please join us in exploring the next dimension of single cell research. You can write to us at hello at pixelgen.com if you have any further questions. Have a great day.